So we, we don't presuppose the, uh, that. We'll wait till there's an actual announcement. So it's uh, being clear, it's not in our forecast, but we mentioned today that, you know, that's one of the things we need to know before doing our next forecast, right? right? And so just to help you guide that, you know, sort of a, if you were to add fiscal stimulus on the order in Canada, $5 billion, let's say, uh, well, that's worth on the order of a quarter, quarter of a point. Uh, it does have about the same macroeconomic effect as a quarter point insurance cut, you see. And, but with a couple of other aspects that matter, if you are using fiscal policy, you actually reduce fiscal vulnerabilities because you raise the denominator of those ratios without people taking on more debt. Uh, as opposed to when you use interest rates to, as a cutting mechanism, you're act actively adding the financial vulnerabilities, encouraging individuals to do the borrowing and the spending right. instead of the government. Although, as your deputy referred to it today, it's, it's different piles of debt, right? Well, so that's right. When uh, the economy is facing a headwind, policy is going to do something, both or, or one or the other, yeah. and that creates a pile of debt in one place or the other. And so until the headwinds go away, I think we'll still be accumulating debt in one form or another. But I think, you know, the headwinds, you can kind of see that either they're going to come to a head and, mm -hmm. you know, if it wasn't for the trade war, I don't think we'd have much of a headwind left. We do have this unusual situation in our country where we can have federal fiscal stimulus um, where we have restraint at the provincial level. How yeah. do you factor that in uh, to the overall outcome? Well, that's, that's just arithmetic. So, uh, you know, the, the Alberta budget was just last, last week, so we were able to incorporate that mm -hmm. in our numbers at the end. And that's a, it's a small downtick, you know, in the level of GDP by the end of the forecast. So that's in there. Um, and uh, as you say, we'll have to wait and see uh, what the federal uh, budget line will look like now that the election's behind us. And uh, I'm sure we'll know in reasonably short order. We have seen, obviously, in this kind of yield-hungry world, Canada is an attractive <clears throat> destination uh, yeah. for, for foreign investors, um, at least in terms of our, our bonds. Our currency has appreciated. Yes. What's the, what are you watching there? Obviously, export uh, export levels will be kind of hurt by too strong a currency. What is that level? What do you worry about when it comes to the loony? Yeah, there's no precise level, Amanda, and especially in this context, because really most of the actions happen between uh, the U.S. dollar and other currencies. Right. We've been relatively stable against the U.S. dollar, which is the one we all pay attention to. Uh, but in fact, uh, against the rest, we're up quite a lot over the last few months. And so that's where it's starting to bite. If your customer is in uh, a country outside the United States, you're feeling the effects. Mm -hmm. And so what that for us, that'll mean, oh, a few export sales don't happen. You know, somebody else gets that deal. And so it starts to feed through an even weaker exports and therefore more downside risk on the inflation forecast. And then when we see those things coming real, that's when we would have them in our forecast and we, we would build that into our judgment about interest rates. So we don't, we don't react in the first instance because, of course, we've got to see how people adapt uh, to the shock itself. You did, I mean, obviously the language in this um, is similar to what it's been, but it remains, I mean, the, the risks remain high, although there's some potential upside. You know, if all of our trade issues resolve, that would obviously be great. Yeah. Just in terms of where we run kind of below capacity in the back half, yeah. what, what would you say are the odds uh, of, a, of an insurance cut, of a, of a kind of a, a mid-period cut to address some additional or unseen weakness? Well, uh, that's why we say we have to watch the data. If, if the data continue to erode, and we say in the, you know, one of the issues we have here is that the trade war has primarily been against manufacturing. You know, tariffs have been all manufactured goods and stuff like that. Yeah. And so the trade war is kind of isolated in that sense. You know, like 80% of our economy is in services, right? Some of them are, are touched by that, but not that many. Mm -hmm. And so what we watch for is, does that sense of malaise that you can see in business decision making right now, globally, does that begin to infect consumers? Yeah. If it starts to cross that wall, then you're starting to see a little more generalized. And that would be the kind of thing that would get you uh, more, more engaged. But as we see it, inflation would, would only drift 0.1 or 0.2 away from from 2%, that's, that's not worth using your firepower, you know, when, when there are costs around it. We uh, talk a lot about household levels of indebtedness. Um, you watch it. <clears throat> We've seen the affordability kind of erode. By some measures, it's getting harder and harder for Canadians to meet their obligations. Right. 
And that is because, there's, for, given our low unemployment rate, we haven't seen the wage growth you, you might expect. Yes. What are you thinking about that? Where is the wage growth? So, you know, we've been through a lot. People can lose sight of what the past 10 years have mm -hmm. been like, especially since we almost got home and then we had the, the, the 2015 uh, collapse in oil prices. So another big tumultuous resorting that goes on. And during that period, you know, you, you get people that well, they get a job, but it's not the job match that they've always been hoping for or anything like that. In the last six to, well, pretty well 12 months, this year anyway, uh, we've got into a higher churn job market. I talk to companies, every single one of them says, I can't find the people that I need. Well, that's, that's actually a good sign because people are shuffling or churning right. through the job market, getting better matches, and wages are going up. We, we looked at the micro data and we discovered that the average wage increase for a churner, someone who quits a job and gets a new job in the same period, 12%. Gives you some idea. Yeah. And the overall wage numbers have now broached the 3% level, which is well above the, you know, the trend line. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think that the signs are starting to accumulate, that that hot job market is starting to get to the right people. And I know I'm saying that, and there's people in Alberta that haven't had the job since 2015, so we, we understand that, and that's, that process, like I said then, would take at least five years to complete, and it is. It's taking that long. I, f I feel badly, but we, you know, at least Canada can show over again its ability to adjust to these things. There was, I mean, you took action uh, mm -hmm. in 2014-15 when there was that great kind of dis relocation. Yeah. Uh, the fed fiscal action was taken. Do we need that kind of action? That <clears throat> very targeted, specific, because we do have again the federal election pointed to. We don't just have an uneven uh, picture politically. Mm -hmm. We have an uneven picture economically. Yes. Well, I, I shouldn't comment on what fiscal policy should do. Uh, but there's no doubt that right now we have a, 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 a bigger than normal spread of regional and sectoral divergence. It's not just regional. Importantly, if you look at good sector versus services sector, good sector is experiencing negative growth mm -hmm. in GDP, and the service sector is like 2.4. And the average happens to be around 1.5. But that's a big spread. And uh, I think that that gives rise to a lot of tensions that, of course, an interest rate setting has no ability to uh, to tackle. That is the job of, of the, our our politician friends, and uh, you know, and their sort of fiscal front how they how they uh, deal with some of those stresses. We uh, have some new signs that the ratification of our new NAFTA, USMCA, might might hit roadblocks in all three countries, actually, um, just because of some of the suggested changes um, on auto parts that are being made. Right. Have we, are we still pricing in concern there or have we taken that off the table and now we have to rethink of the effect of that? I think companies I talk to are saying they're just waiting and seeing, they'll believe it when they see it because it is come and gone, come and gone. Um, overall, I'm, re I'm optimistic that uh, this is gonna happen. Uh, and when it does, that is gonna make quite a difference to people's planning. Yes. Uh, because I can tell it sure has made a difference to their planning while it's been in limbo. Uh, so the global thing, that, that matters a great deal, but if we were able to solve the Kuzma, uh, or USMCA as you prefer, uh, ratification, I think that would make a significant difference to our outlook. Confidence is so important. Uh, yeah. We've seen businesses obviously uh, aware of all of the uncertainties and change their planning. Consumer confidence, mindful of the headline risk here, yeah. we can talk ourselves into a That's negative right. state of being. It does feel to me, and I'm curious for whether you would agree, the consumers feel less confident than the data says they should. Yes. And that has implications. For, what do we do about the fact that there is this weird disconnect right now? Well, I, 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 I don't know. One thing we should, we should avoid is talking ourselves into a, right. a downturn. I, I agree with that. Uh, but this, this, uh, this, this air of uncertainty or anxiety can have multiple sources. It could be technology. It could be people worried that you know, they're going to be displaced mm -hmm. by some AI or something like this. Uh, those are the sorts of things that happen in, in these waves. And the only real way, I think, to, uh, to manage this is to ensure, reassure people that we have a great safety net, that, you know, look at, look at uh, Lucy, she lost her job, but look at that one month later, she's got something that's even better. These things are, the economy is working, it's functioning. Mm -hmm. And uh, that, that governments are out there saying, hey, uh, this, this could happen, if that happens, we're gonna do this and we're gonna take care of it. I, th I think, uh, you know, in the end, uh, we're vulnerable. We're not an island. We can't, we can't avoid all this stuff. 
Uh, but I think the good news is we start this one in a much stronger place than we were five years ago. Uh, we've got unemployment, as you say, it's not perfect, but it's pretty well an all-time low. So, uh, and inflation's on target, so we're kind of in a, as close to home as we can get, so we're in a, we're in a good place to be able to cope uh, with what comes out our way. Are you, I mean, we do have obviously some major friction uh, for our oil industry. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's short term, maybe it's long term. Maybe this is the beginning of the great sectoral shift that Canada will have to go through. Are you optimistic about Canada? Oh, I'm optimistic about Canada, yes. Uh, for one thing I'm, I'm pretty sure of is that, you know, oil, oil being a $90 billion a year business, it's not, not going anywhere, okay? It may not be an engine of massive growth, but that's okay. That's a, Let's just keep the growth, let's just keep the capacity rising and, and working away on that. But I do think that, that, that setting that aside, so many new things have come out of the, of the devastation that happened during the rise of oil prices. Like some 10,000 firms disappeared, mm -hmm. mostly exporting firms because the Canadian dollar was going up so fast. Well, now we can point to huge growth in things that we weren't even sectors we weren't touching. The leading growth ex ex sector in exports is IT services. It's also growing, the sector is growing by over 7% per year. Um, this, this is a huge business that we didn't really have one before, you know? And uh, there are many others of that ilk that I think, uh, you know, if you looked underneath the data, you'd be pretty surprised by them. Just think about education exports. It's a big growth business. Yeah. And it's also the best channel for us to recruit you know, immigration, right? Right. When they're coming out of our own universities and they, they like it here and they like to stay. This is how the bank does it. There is a uh, technology shift that could be coming that could drastically change the way central banks work, and that is this form of digital currency. Yes. I know the bank's been looking at this for a long time and may in front, be in front of a lot of your peers on yes. your thinking about it. Yes. Now we have Libra. Mm -hmm. Do you have thoughts about the best way to go at a global currency and whether it's a good idea at all? Well, there are significant inefficiencies in the, in the global financial system now, some of which became bigger inefficiencies in the wake of Basel III and so on. Just the, the way banks handle remittances mm -hmm. or other cross-border payments, Just a number of banks have kind of gotten out of that business because it's capital intensive business. And you have to know any money laundering rules and all. if you can just avoid that, then that's easier. So this is why something like Libra can come along and say, well, we'll solve that with you know, so many people on Facebook and you just transfer money on Facebook. And you think, well, that, that does solve a problem. But of course, it presents other risks. And so uh, we're, we're actively studying this in concert with our, our G7 and G20 colleagues. Uh, by the end of this year, or certainly in January, we'll put out a piece which will help people understand where we fit you know, all that. Uh, that will be, you know, to say, you know, when, when does a central bank need a digital currency? Mm -hmm. You know, and there, and there may come a time. We'll lay out the conditions when that might be the case. And, um, and what sorts of things, well, other things we need to know before we'd even contemplate doing it. Uh, it's, uh, it's an incredibly interesting uh, thing. But, you know, you have cash on you, right? And so, yep. a little bit. Everybody still has some. So, you know that someday if it's all digital, chances are we're going to have some form of central bank cash, but it might be digital form in our pocket. You know, bang, 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 I'm there, I'm paid. And uh, so that's what we're trying to figure out, how that will look and how we manage it. And does it need to be managed by central banks or could private entities be in control of it? No, uh, there, there's an essential public good aspect to the cash in your pocket. If you, if you owed me $20 and you gave me the $20, then we're done. But if you say, I'll write you a check, or I'm gonna give you an e-transfer, well then I'm waiting for it to run through the system and there's a degree of uncertainty associated with that. And if the system goes down on Friday night in the middle of a thunderstorm, well then we, we've got another problem. Yeah. So that finality, the public good part of what, what cash delivers, that's still gonna be needed in this digital world. And so there will still be a public sector form of that. That doesn't mean that you can't have private, uh, clearers doing those kinds of things, absolutely right.